In this video, we're going to take a look at the GrowWatt Infinity 1500 Portable Power Station. If you've been paying attention to the solar industry lately, especially the off-grid world, you already know the company GrowWatt. They're a huge manufacturer of solar inverters. But they're about to make a splash in the portable power station world by jumping in with a 1500 watt hour unit called the Infinity 1500. On paper, it looks awesome. With 2000 watts of AC output from the inverter, the ability to parallel three of them to triple the capacity, a smartphone app for monitoring, the ability to act as a UPS, up to 800 watts of solar charging input, and one of the fastest charging speeds I've seen to date. It hasn't been released just yet, but you can currently pre-order one for $1,400 US dollars on their website. I'll put a link in the video description below. If you're new to my review videos, I don't spend a ton of time going over features and how to use the product, but I am going to put this thing to the test. Before we do that though, here's a brief montage of what the unboxing looks like and what comes inside. In addition to the user manual, you get an MC4 solar charging cable, a cigarette lighter charging cable, and an AC charging cable. On the front of the Infinity 1500 is an LED screen, the USB connections, and various on-off buttons. Also on the front are two fan intake ports. On top is a wireless charger for phones that have that capability. On the right side are the four AC outlets and the 10 amp DC cigarette lighter outlet, on the left side are the charging ports for solar and AC, as well as a circuit breaker. You'll notice this hinged lid that covers the inputs. The lid doesn't stay shut and may break during outdoor use or during transport. The back side is empty except for the two fans, which exhausts out the back. Okay, on to the testing. To get ready for the first test, I plugged in the Infinity 1500 to charge it up. I was blown away as I watched the input power continue to climb to over 1400 watts. That is by far the highest input charge of any model I have ever reviewed. Unfortunately, it didn't stay there for long, and the next week of testing gave me fits as the AC charging ranged from a blistering 1400 watts down to 350 watts. More on that later. Here is the testing sheet for our series of tests. In the left column are the factory ratings or claims. In the middle column, we'll record the actual results, and in the right column, any notes or explanations. Our first test is the low power test. Here's my test rig for AC output where I can use various incandescent bulbs to dial in whatever load I want. For this test, I'm aiming for about 30% power or 600 watts. You'll see me using an AC power meter on various tests to verify that the wattage displayed by the Infinity is accurate and to test other electrical parameters. To get to 600 watts, I used two 250 watt heat lamps and a 100 watt light bulb. This worked perfectly because the inverter is outputting a full 120 volts AC, whereas sometimes competitor models only output 100 volts or 110 volts. I did notice that the frequency was only 50 hertz, which is fine, but not ideal for all devices. In my week of testing, I saw the unit inexplicably switch from 50 hertz to 60 hertz and back again a few times. More on that later. The Infinity held steady at 600 watts the entire way to empty, which is great. And after a little over two hours, it shut off. So our first test was a pass. Now some of you might be confused or disagree that 84% is good enough, but keep in mind that internally these power stations are using an inverter to convert from DC power from the batteries to AC power, and that process is not perfectly efficient. Almost every power station on the market will fall somewhere between 80% and 95%, and none of them will ever score 100%. That's just physics. After recharging the Infinity again, it was time for the second test, the high power test. This time I'm aiming for about 70% of max power, or about 1400 watts. To do that, I need something more power hungry than just my heat lamps, so I grabbed a space heater. On its low setting, it should use around 750 watts, and then I'll add the rest with the heat lamps. So I plugged in the heater first and got it going, and then verified its power consumption with the power meter. To get a little bit over my target load, I ended up using three of the 250 watt heat lamps. 
So I let it run and monitored the output. This time the power output did sag a little bit toward the end, but still averaged right around 1400 watts overall. Here you can see the Migro app that connects to the Infinity and lets you see a few things that you can't see from the LED screen, such as the internal temperature. Notice that the temperature is 43 Celsius, or about 109 Fahrenheit. The Infinity's fans are always on when it's putting out power, but at this higher load, the fans were working pretty hard. So I grabbed my decibel meter, and my son helped me measure around 60 decibels. That wasn't the loudest that the fans can get, as you'll see later. 60 decibels isn't horrible, but definitely isn't quiet either. Here you can see that the AC output also dropped down to about 110 volts during this test, which is still within spec of the US power grid, but interesting to note nonetheless. After 53 minutes, the Infinity gave up. That gives it a passing score again at about 82% of the expected runtime based on factory capacity ratings. Again, that's about average for these power stations. Nothing bad, but nothing great either. Normally with my testing procedure, when I get done with a test, I turn around and plug the power station back in and recharge it immediately. But the Infinity was very sensitive to heat and refused to even charge at all after this test. Now I talked to GrowWatt extensively about this, and they say it's working as intended. But in my opinion, 49 Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit is not that hot and should not prevent me from recharging the device at all. The Infinity 1500 uses NMC lithium cells, which is slightly better than lithium iron phosphate in power density, making it lighter weight and smaller, but doesn't last as long. And it does go into thermal runaway at a lower temperature, but numerous studies show that doesn't happen until at least 150 Celsius. So, in my opinion, the Growatt engineer should retune the Infinity's charging parameters through a firmware patch in the future. Anyways, as you can see, it finally did accept a charge after letting it sit for several hours, but it limited the charging input to about 775 watts at the most, and the Infinity lowers the charging input power when it gets over 80% full, so the full process took almost 5 hours to fully recharge. I'll tell you how to get around these heat issues later in the video. Moving on, I decided to test the runtime when using DC power output. I just completed my DC test rig, which you can see uses a bunch of small halogen light sockets that I can put various size halogen bulbs in to achieve whatever target wattage I want. For this test, we are testing the cigarette lighter socket output, which is rated at 10 amps. So this test is going to take a long time to run. I used one 100 watt halogen bulb and four 5 watt halogen bulbs to try to get as close as possible to 120 watts or 10 amps. Even at this low level of output, you can see that the fans are still noticeable at 50 decibels. Using a clamp meter, I verified that we were as close to 10 amps as I could get. So I let the test run all day and checked back periodically. The output held rock steady the entire time at around 130 watts. The fans did get a little louder as the test progressed. The ambient temperature in my garage was about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Finally, after running for 9.5 hours, the Infinity shut off. That equates to about 1235 watt hours or about 82% of the expected runtime and capacity. I gave it a passing grade here because these larger power stations usually use higher voltage battery banks inside instead of wiring all the cells for 12 volts. So converting from higher voltage down to 12 volt DC output will not be as efficient as you might hope, and 80% or above is acceptable in my opinion. With the Infinity recharged one last time, it was time for our torture tests. These tests are designed to verify surge capabilities and whether or not the power station can handle transient inductive loads like compressor motors. A surge rating of 4000 watts is beyond my ability to test. I don't have the test equipment to measure that kind of a spike accurately and quickly. So what I do instead is go above the rated output of the power station by at least a few hundred watts and let it run for at least 10 seconds and see what happens. Before we start, my test unit that I was sent was locked in to the default 1800 watt output. 
you'll be able to choose to enable the full 2000 watt output in a future release of the Migro app. But as of this upload, that's not available for me. With that in mind, I used the space heater on high and then added in several heat lamps until it reached almost 2200 watts and let it run. And it kept running for almost two minutes at that power level. That's pretty amazing. All of the other power stations I've ever tested will either immediately shut off or stop within 10 to 20 seconds. The next torture test is a 10,000 BTU window air conditioner. On paper, the Infinity should handle this easily. But it all comes down to the electronic components in the inverter and whether they can handle a really fast surge current. I've tested quite a few inverters that claim surge ratings well over 1000 watts but can't do this. So with the air conditioner set on its highest setting, I turned it on and waited for a minute for the compressor motor to kick on. No problem at all. So if it can handle an air conditioner, we don't need to worry about the dorm fridge test. The dorm fridge has a smaller compressor motor that would be even easier for the Infinity. So chalk up three more pass tests. While I had the Infinity indoors, I wanted to test the UPS capability. A UPS or uninterruptible power supply should be able to switch from grid power to battery power fast enough that a computer like this one will not shut off. So I tested it several times, unplugging the AC charging cable and the computer kept operating. This also proves that the pass-through charging of the Infinity works as well. So that's two more tests that are successful. Unfortunately, I don't have an oscilloscope yet to test the waveform and verify that it's pure sine wave. Hopefully I can get one for future reviews. Next, I grabbed a solar panel and headed back outside. I apologize that it's hard to see the LED screen here. Now, I don't have 800 watts of solar panels laying around to test the max solar input but I can verify that it works just fine with a single 12 volt panel. And I can check the dual charging capability, which means it can solar charge and AC charge at the same time. You can see that the AC charger is active at the bottom and the solar charger above it is also adding in some more power. And I also disconnected the solar and the AC charging power did not change, which means the AC charger is not being throttled to keep the dual charging power under some kind of limit. So there are two more tests complete. A lot of competitors in this size range can only operate with multiple solar panels. So it's nice to be able to use just one panel, even if it takes many hours to recharge. Now to circle back to some of the issues I promised to address earlier. To be able to use the incredible fast charging capabilities of the Infinity 1500, you'll have to keep it indoors or in outdoor cold temperatures. At least bring it in overnight and then fast charge it in the morning like I did here. In my testing, as long as the internal temperature was in the 20s or very low 30s Celsius, the fast charger went nuts and I was able to charge it to full in two hours or less. I know that isn't ideal because a lot of you are buying this to use it outdoors and maybe recharging this with a generator or shore power connection at a campground or something. Anyways, let's look at the final score sheet. Overall, the capacity of this power station is rated fairly accurately, so that gets a check mark. But the AC charging is a mixed bag, so I gave it a pass and a fail. The continuous AC output of this device easily gets a pass. And the voltage and frequency get a pass too, but I also gave them a half fail. I did that because the voltage does sag down to 110 volts sometimes, and the frequency will wander between 50 Hz and 60 Hz unless you hold down the AC output button for 6 seconds and manually select the frequency you want. In my opinion, it should always be 60 Hz for the US market. I can't think of any reason why anyone would ever want 50 Hz. Plus, all of their specification sheets show an output of 60 Hz and there's no mention of 50 Hz. So they either need to drop the 50 Hz option and make it permanently 60 Hz or update their specification sheets to show both choices. And that leads into my conclusions. This is an incredible piece of hardware that we're gonna have to wait a bit to have its full glory unlocked by software updates. I've expressed my criticisms to Growatt and they heard me loud and clear. The good news is all of the weaknesses can be cleared up with updates. 
So if you buy the hardware, you can enjoy future improvements without feeling gypped because you bought an early model that didn't have future hardware fixes. So there should be nothing holding you back from getting in on the early adopter sale going on right now. I have confidence in GrowWatt because of their huge name in solar inverters. They aren't going to tarnish their brand name with a failed release. As it sits right now, it's one of the better units on the market. But if they can make a few tweaks, they probably have the best 1500 watt hour unit on the market, hands down. Thanks for watching this video. If you found it helpful, please leave me a comment and a thumbs up below.